All right, hello everyone. Thanks for coming to the last talk of the day before the keynotes. We really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully you're here for real world experiences with Cloud Foundry on Windows. If not, don't run away. It's gonna be a great presentation, I promise. I promise, it's great. gonna be great. All right, quick introduction. I'm Matthew Horan, I'm a software developer at Pivotal. Uh, I worked on the Greenhouse Project, which is uh, Garden Windows and Bosch Windows, our deployment tool, for uh, about a year. Uh, then I worked on SteelToe, which was an initiative to help developing cloud-native applications for Cloud Foundry easier. And uh, I am Steve Minario. I'm a strategic product owner at Pivotal uh, and formerly the pro uh, product manager for the Greenhouse Project, uh, working on Windows and .NET support and kind of the whole end-to-end -end story. So, .NET development, before we jump into kind of lessons learned uh, around deploying .NET and, and PCF or uh, Cloud Foundry on .NET, we want to talk about kind of the state of the world with .NET development. So, let's take a, a quick poll. Who here is running .NET applications in production today? All right, we got a couple hands. Who here is interested in running .NET applications? All right, a few more, excellent. Um, so, I, I won't necessarily ask you to raise your hands for the rest, but I want you to think about how are you managing those application dependencies today? Are you using NuGet or using um, maybe something directly tied into TFS? Uh, how do you troubleshoot production issues on the server? Do you remote desktop into the actual web server uh, and, and kind of affect what's going on on that production machine? Do you know the names of any of your web servers? Uh, this is all like really common patterns that we've seen, um, particularly in the .NET and the Windows development world. Um, and some of them have, have started to, to fade out uh, in the Linux development world with tools like Cloud Foundry. Um, but we're bringing Windows kind of kicking and screaming into the future. Uh, and that, that's part of what we've been working on with the Greenhouse Project. So um, this, is a, th this kind of summarizes it. Um, Great job configuring servers this year, said no CEO ever. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of the value of Cloud Foundry, right? Uh, is that you can focus on developing applications and driving value uh, to your customers rather than worrying about the configuration and all of the underlying things uh, underneath. So Cloud Foundry to the rescue. Except that's only for Linux. But wait, it's not. Uh, so uh, about two years ago, Pivotal uh, undertook an effort to fully support Windows on Cloud Foundry. Uh, before we started on that effort, there were a number of partners of Pivotal that had begun some work on that effort. Uh, early efforts there included uh, Iron Foundry, which was a port of the DEA to support Windows. And uh, once we started on our effort to rewrite the execution agent, Diego, uh, we, we made sure that it was uh, abstract enough to support Windows. And so we undertook that effort. Uh, thanks to Mark here in the audience for kicking that off. Uh, so two things were required to, to get us there. Uh, Garden Windows, which was the implementation of the Garden API for Windows specifically, and Bosch Windows. Uh, so we targeted developers first, and Garden Windows was that effort to get Cloud Foundry in the hand of our developers as quickly as possible. And that was really an MVP approach, but we got it out there, we were able to get it deployed, and we had a number of large-scale customers actually successfully deploy that and run production applications on Windows from Cloud Foundry. And since then, we've been focusing on the operator experience. And Bosch Windows is the operator experience. So we'll touch a little bit more on that. Uh, to get everything running, all we had to do was port the Diego components, rep, Metron, and the console agent to Windows. And that was really easy because that's all Go, and we were able to target Windows and just build a binary and implement Garden Windows, which was not too complicated. So why is Bosch so, uh, so awesome, right? Uh, there have been a few talks about this, I think, and hopefully you know this by now, but Bosch is the way to deploy Cloud Foundry. 
Uh, the open source CF releases are all Bosch releases. And if you want to know how to deploy CF, you need that Bosch release. So we initially started with a pretty cumbersome uh, Windows installer process, MSIs that you had to configure and set up and get running on Windows. Uh, then we moved to the Bosch release. Bosch is great because it enforces uh, immutable infrastructure. So Stephen touched on this earlier. Uh, you might have a lot of snowflake servers that are individually configured and you know, it took a lot of time and a lot of different people to get those servers together and maybe some of those people have left your company and you have no idea how that server was configured. Bosch makes that impossible. Uh, you can rebuild those servers forever and ever and ever, whatever you want. Uh, you can do what we call rotate, repair, and repave. That's uh, going to be covered on another slide here. But basically, uh, instead of keeping these servers around forever and letting them get infected with viruses and worms and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Just blow it away and stand it up again. And this allows you to have a cohesive deployment process across all Cloud Foundry. So instead of having this kind of wonky Windows installer process for Windows, you can now just Bosch deploy all the things. So um, to, to kind of summarize the state of .NET on Cloud Foundry today, uh, Windows support for Cloud Foundry was GA in October of last year. Uh, so it's been about a year now of kind of GA production ready support. Um, and the, the deployment, as, as Matt just mentioned, is a little bit different. It was a little bit wonky with, uh, with an MSI installer, uh, still automatable. Uh, and certainly we've seen a lot of success with our customers using this process. Uh, but we're working towards now uh, this Bosch Windows. So it's currently in beta. Um, and so it's pretty much done, uh, <laughs> but maybe not ready for, for, uh, for production quite yet. Um, in addition to that, we have .NET Core, uh, a really exciting project from Microsoft, um, which is kind of a rewrite of the .NET library or the .NET um, uh, framework uh, from the bottom up to be cross-platform. So you can write a .NET Core application that can be deployed on Windows, on Mac, or on Linux. Uh, and so we already have a build pack from the, the Cloud Foundry community that supports .NET Core on Linux. Um, and then we have the, the recently kicked off Steel Toe project, uh, which Matt was talking about before, and we'll talk about a little bit more, which provides a, a framework similar to Spring Cloud services for uh, .NET developers. Um, and to that, to that effect, there's, there's also a book uh, written by some of our colleagues at Pivotal about writing microservices for .NET. Um, so this is kind of the state of the world today, uh, and we're going to continue talking about what we've done with this world. So when you're targeting Cloud Foundry, there are some important things to keep in mind. Uh, one of the core tenets is 12-factor. Uh, so I'm not going to read through these bullet points here, and you can read more about all this on 12factor.net. But if you're just getting started with Cloud Foundry, I recommend that you check that out. If you already know 12factor and you have some .NET apps and you want to put them on the platform, uh, it's important to keep all of those ideas in mind when you're targeting Cloud Foundry. For example, where are your logs going, right? Uh, so think about that. Uh, building microservices is, is still probably a good thing with, with .NET, and so the Steel Toe project helps you do that. When you break down those large projects and you can push them up as individual components that both scale independently and then have their own resources tied to them, that's a much easier infrastructure to manage uh, from the developer's point of view. Even though it complicates the overall software architecture, uh, it's a lot easier to reason about. And uh, all of this allows you to have continuous delivery and continuous deployment through some sort of continuous integration pipeline. Uh, and you might use maybe Concourse for that or something like that. So what have we learned? Um, I want to emphasize here. Like, this is the part of the talk that you're all here for, right? This is, this is the thing. This is what we've learned from our experience in deploying and battle testing uh, Cloud Foundry on Windows. Uh, so over the past year, uh, and a little bit prior even before GA, uh, we at Pivotal have been working with our customers to deploy this in production. This isn't a toy. This, isn't, this is production stuff and lessons learned um, from kind of running up against the issues in the field. Uh, and so we're hoping to share those with you here uh, so that you can avoid some of those same issues. Um, our biggest customers are running dozens of Windows cells 
Um, we have hundreds of a app instances in production uh, across uh, a num two continents, I think, maybe three. Uh, so <laughs> all over the world, we've got, we've got customers doing this and doing it successfully. Um, and so we're here to share some of this, this learnings, these learnings with you. Um, and in fact, some of the, several of the .NET applications are working together with services provided by Spring apps on Linux. Uh, so once again, the .NET on Windows and the .NET, or the, uh, uh, sorry, .NET in Cloud Foundry works well with Linux in Cloud Foundry, as you might expect. Great, so one of the first problems that you might run into is uh, database creation and authentication. How do databases get created in your organization? Do you have a DBA? Do you send an email to some IT team and magically, like, four weeks later, a database shows up, right? Uh, this is like a typical pattern and, in fact, uh, actual example from a, from a customer who, when they worked on the .NET applications uh, at that company before they were enabled with Cloud Foundry, uh, this was actually a customer that had started putting things uh, on CF Via, uh, via Java, and they were utilizing uh, Java and CF, but they hadn't yet had .NET deployed. So whenever they had to touch those .NET apps, you know, it was weeks and weeks and weeks of lag between getting that application code uh, finished on a developer's machine and then hooked up to a production database. And so uh, that's a problem, right? How do you get those things? Uh, sometimes these databases and the networks are configured such that every machine on the network is completely trusted. So you have a front-end web server that has complete access to the SQL database. Uh, Windows domain authentication is built in and free, and so not only are the database credentials non-existent, you're just trusting the network, uh, but it's really easy for developers to utilize Windows authentication to authorize requests to the application. And so not always, not always a great practice. So what do we do about that? Cloud Foundry service brokers. Uh, has anyone here used a service broker? Yeah, all right. We got a couple. So, so service brokers are the answer here, right? Because they manage the creation uh, of, of databases and credentials, and then the credentials are provided to the application seamlessly. Um, so in this way, you get, you get kind of the, the security uh, as well as kind of all the benefits of, of the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. Uh, this also helps with defense in depth. So if a particular web server is compromised, um, we've seen scenarios where uh, simply like machine name authentication or machine authentication via Windows domain would give you access to a SQL database somewhere. So if the machine was compromised uh, and you didn't notice about and didn't know about it, then now the, the attacker has full access to the database. Uh, and so that's not the case here as much. And it makes it much easier to rotate credentials. Uh, this comes back to something that Matt touched on earlier, rotate, repair, and repave, uh, which are the three R's of security that we've been talking about a lot at Pivotal lately. Um, our director of security, Justin Smith, has a great blog post about it. I recommend you go check it out. Um, but rotate credentials very frequently. Uh, repair uh, any, any issues or any vulnerabilities that you find in your code or in your ecosystem. And repave the machine. So if if a VM is ephemeral, if it only turns on, or a container only turns on for, for 24 hours at a time, if, a, if an attacker gets into that machine, it's gonna be blown away in a couple of hours. And so there's a limited amount of uh, damage that they can do in that time. Uh, so the three R's really come into effect here. So the next problem might be uh, implicit application authentication. So I kind of touched on this on the last slide, but uh, it's really easy to use Windows authentication to protect your application. But maybe that's not a great idea. It's really tempting because you get that uh, domain controller and LDAP integration and it's super easy, but uh, with Windows cells and the uh, security mindset that we have with Cloud Foundry and deployment of Cloud Foundry, uh, maybe it's not a great idea to domain join those cells if we're gonna rotate, repair, and repave them. And so, you can't use Windows domain authentication with Windows cells. So the solution here is use UAA for application authentication. Um, refactoring application to use OAuth uh, is, 
is a great best practice because not only can you still use UAA, which can be backed by LDAP, so you can have the same, same authentication, uh, uh, same credentials that you had before, um, but using UAA allows you to make this app more portable, more global, uh, sorry, not, not using UAA, using OAuth, uh, allows you to make it more global and you can support things, uh, perhaps a client that is not necessarily Windows domain joined. So the next problem is uh, unknown app dependencies. So we had a customer who uh, discovered there was a security module that was required by their machine config. They had no idea how that module got there on the system. Uh, turns out it was injected by the security team uh, via a group policy, right? And so this is kind of the norm uh, we've found in, in interacting with some of our customers. Basically, uh, not all of the dependencies of applications are, are known, uh, either at compile time or at deploy time. Uh, so not using NuGet or other dependency management systems for dependencies means you just don't know where they come from, right? Uh, DB2 drivers are pretty notorious for this. So the solution here is to use a dependency management system. Um, NuGet is great, but realistically, it can be anything you want. Um, use one of them. Uh, bin deploy everything. So store all of your configuration in a single place um, and, and keep your configuration together. Uh, and some dependencies don't actually support being bin deployed. So DB2 is the, the canonical example there uh, that we've run into in a number of places. Um, work with your vendors to, to get those dependencies updated so that they can be bin deployed. Uh, or else work to migrate off of them uh, would, be, would be our recommendation because this type of thing can really throw you for a loop. Uh, session store. So sessions are, are great. They're pretty important uh, when you have a stateful application. And so you might be storing that session local on your server. And if you're doing that, you're probably relying on sticky sessions of some sort to make sure that every incoming request gets routed to the same app instance. Something like that isn't going to work great in the CF infrastructure because CF instances are ephemeral. And so you really don't want somebody's session going away when you restart an app instance while you're deploying code. And of course, the, the solution here is to use a database for, for session storage. Um, it should be pretty easy to configure something like MySQL or Redis. Uh, both of them are available for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, and you can use them for, for session state and, and kind of ephemeral storage like that. Um, really, if you're building a, a modern kind of 12-factor application, you shouldn't be storing anything locally. So logging, right? Uh, everyone needs those logs. There was a great talk about tuning Loggergator earlier today. Uh, and we support Loggergator, right? Uh, however, applications need to be tuned to work with Loggergator. Uh, but why does this matter, right? Uh, legacy applications typically use the Windows event log. Just log to the Windows event log. It's really easy. But have you ever tried to search through two gigs of XML? It's pretty tedious. Uh, you also don't know what instance your application is running on, particularly in a distributed system. So Cloud Foundry is going to leverage all the Windows cells that you've deployed to support its infrastructure. You really don't want to have to go connect to each of those and search through the event log. And of course, the solution here is to use a configurable logging framework. Um, Log4Net is a great example. Um, the, it has a console appender uh, as, as one, of the, one of the output options that just writes to the correct place uh, and it gets picked up by Loggerator and everything is great. Um, and then Loggerator, of course, brings all of those logs centrally so that you just need to type, you as a developer just need to type CF logs, uh, and you can get access to all of them regardless of which cell is potentially misbehaving or you're trying to find an issue or troubleshoot or diagnose something. All right, next up. So we had a customer that had written a bunch of custom ISAPI handlers. Uh, they're great because they really empower developers to do anything. Uh, anything. For example, they were generating uh, PDFs of receipts that were being 
passed from an application, which is cool, uh, except that they don't really work well with Cloud Foundry. Uh, and that's because they rely on IIS and some legacy aspects of IIS and shared memory and, and all sorts of scary things when you're running multi-tenant, multiple applications on scaled backends, right? So with great power comes great responsibility. So there's a very simple solution here. Don't do that. <laughs> Customized API handlers can, because you can do anything, they can cause lots of trouble. Uh, so use them warily, if at all. Uh, we, we don't really recommend it at all, because uh, you can run into a lot of issues when you're trying to migrate to uh, a cloud-native system like, like Cloud Foundry. There are plenty of other ways to generate PDFs. <laughs> Uh, configuration sprawl. So we, we touched on this a few slides back, but uh, you can really get pretty confused about where configuration bits are coming from. You've got machine config, you've got app config, you've got multiple layers of app config, web config. All these things come together to make a configuration. And developers might be leveraging that for like cool things, for example, uh, local development versus production development versus wherever, staging. Uh, doesn't really work well with this model of I just have an application and I, and I want to push it, especially CF push it, right? And it's definitely not a 12-factor approach. So in line with 12-factor uh, recommendations, store the configuration in the environment. Uh, so use environment variables or uh, CUPS, uh, custom user provided services for your environment configuration. Uh, and, and don't snowflake your, your servers. Uh, if you know the name of a web server, of a server that you have, it's probably been around for too long. Uh, if it has specific characteristics, like I know that Tabasco takes a long time to reboot because it's got spinning disks instead of SSDs, that's, that's terrible. Um, so, so get all of your configuration, uh, provide it in a single, single place, and, and don't snowflake those cells because you don't want something unique on one server and another server. Uh, have all the configuration in a single place, and you can easily rebuild uh, that, that configuration as needed or that, that uh, environment. And just to touch on that in a, in a couple more, more slides, one of the things that uh, Steeltoe provides is a mechanism for abstracting that config out of files and putting it in a Git repo, which is pretty neat. Uh, so some, some extra gotchas, uh, cross-sell encryption, right? Particularly interesting if you have uh, that session cookie, right? Maybe you're encrypting some data on the client. You want that to come back trusted. Uh, wait a minute. If that's going to go to any backend that's running on a Windows cell, you need to make sure that the same host key is configured on each of those systems. So you can override that via the web config. Uh, the global assembly cache, uh, another thing that's not going to work well. So if you have assemblies that you need to put on your systems, uh, you don't want to go touch a single server and then forget about all these other Windows cells that you've set up. Then when your application boots up on another cell, it's going to fail to start. So we just recommend against that, back to the uh, dependency management and using something like NuGet or whatever. Uh, and then uh, network shares and persistent disk. So we have come across a few examples with our customers of applications that have hard-coded UNC paths. They're trying to reach out directly to network shares. Again, going back to this trusted environment, we trust every system that's out here. Wait a minute, you trust a public-facing web server with access to all of your backend storage? So uh, don't do that, right? Uh, try to leverage other services, either CF service brokers or something like that. Uh, and if you do write to that local disk, remember, is going to get wiped away. So what could be better, the future, right? We talked a little bit about Steeltoe. Uh, so what we bring you are Spring Cloud clients for ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core. We, we support both 4, 5 plus and Core. Uh, unfortunately, not all things support both languages quite yet. We're still waiting on uh, a number of missing features from Microsoft and the foundation, uh, the .NET foundation, to finish some of those connectors. So basically, uh, 4.5 and 4.6 are fully supported, but core is not fully supported yet. Uh, but basically, you have the Spring Cloud config server, so that's what I touched on about removing that config from being splattered across your disk. 
Uh, service discovery with Eureka, so if you have multiple applications that need to talk to each other, they can discover each other via Eureka. And this is going back to that customer who had the uh, Spring applications talking to their .NET applications, talking to their Spring applications. They're utilizing Eureka for that service discovery. Spring Cloud Connectors, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, and this works with both open source or our productized Spring Cloud services. So Spring Cloud Connectors, right? We support uh, SQL Server and EF6. EF6 is where the challenge comes from, uh, .NET Core. We just don't have it yet. Uh, MySQL, Redis, RabbitMQ, and Postgres just came out relatively recently. So continuing to look at the future, um, we get a bunch of questions. What does the future look like? Well, here it is. Uh, Windows 2016 was announced, uh, actually just this week was the, the GA was announced, uh, and it's going to be available on MSDN shortly. Windows 2016 is supported today um, by the Cloud Foundry bits that are available uh, in Garden Windows, uh, open source in the foundation, et cetera. Um, improved container isolation and network virtualization is coming soon in, uh, in Server 2016. And then the Bosch Windows GA is planned to come soon, uh, as well as improvements to Steel Toe, but we've, we've talked about that enough. Um, so Bosch Windows will be GA relatively soon as well, uh, and that'll be really exciting. So as we've gone through this journey of bringing .NET uh, uh, to becoming a first-class citizen in Cloud Foundry, um, today we talked about a lot of the lessons that we've learned from, from actually deploying this and running it in production uh, with a number of customers, um, dozens of servers. Uh, uh, we, we've gone through and, and lived this pain so that hopefully you don't have to. Um, and we've, we've brought these lessons learned. Um, but Bosch Windows is going to come very soon to simplify this experience. Um, and then .NET Core is now fully supported. Uh, so .NET Core is available on Linux uh, as well as on Windows. And we think, you know, imagine this world where, where you're strangling this .NET monolith that you have, uh, that you've had for years. Um, and you, you pick it up and you move it over to Cloud Foundry. Uh, and then as you, you strangle it and you take apart the different pieces, you start writing new parts, new microservices that you want to write in .NET Core so that it can be ready for the future. But you're not quite there yet because not all the pieces of .NET Core are there. So you start writing in .NET Core, you're using Steel Toe uh, to connect to your Eureka server. Um, and because you're using .NET Core on Windows, you can use legacy dependencies that still run on Windows in Windows 2012, 2016. Uh, and as you're ready, as those dependencies get replaced or rebuilt, um, you can move, you have the flexibility to move to .NET Core on Linux. Uh, so th there's a really great story there that you can do all of that within Cloud Foundry. Uh, you can Bosch deploy all of your servers, uh, your Linux and Windows side by side. You can CF push all of your apps, Linux and Windows side by side. And you get all of the logging and monitoring in the same place. Um, and we're really excited about this story and about uh, bringing .NET to a first-class citizen within Cloud Foundry. Um, so on that note. Cool. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone who's contributed to the open source uh, support for Garden Windows. So uh, the current team is comprised of uh, some folks that are based in Pivotal's New York office. Uh, but we had previous contributions from CenturyLink and HP. And I want to call out our friend uh, Stefan over here, who spent some time with us in New York and really helped us uh, make Garden Windows awesome. So thanks to everyone uh, for helping make this successful. So we have the uh, standard we're hiring slide. Get, please get in touch. Uh, but outside of that, I think we have about two minutes for questions if, uh, if anyone has any questions. All right, well, thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it.